Welcome back to the Reptiles and Research podcast, hosted by myself, Liam Sinclair, and Ellie Hills. Today's guest is Francis Coschieri, who's here to talk about a very niche group of snakes. The African sand snakes, or not African sand snakes, depending on what Francis will tell you later on in this video. Now Francis has provided hundreds of images for me to use in this episode, so if you're listening to this on any podcasting platform, it might be worth going back and watching this on YouTube when you get a chance, just to see those images. Before we dive into today's episode, we would like to thank our sponsors, Custom Reptile Habitats. If you're interested in premium PVC reptile enclosures, you can follow through the link below on YouTube or in the show notes. Anything you do purchase gives us an extra kickback at no extra cost to you. So upgrading your reptile care, you can support the running of this podcast. If you want to know who future guests are ahead of time and be able to submit your questions to them before they come on, then you can join the Patreon for £1 a month and that will give you access, as well as all the other content that's available on Patreon. There's no obligation, but if you want to support the running of the channel, then that's there for you. You can find some really cool reptile shirts over at thereptilemerchstore.com, celebrating better care and spreading the message through subtle designs. Right now, if you use the code REGIS10, you get 10% off your order. Now that housekeeping's out of the way, let's get into today's episode. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Francis. I believe we're going to talk about a particular genus today, and I'm about to butcher the name of it, but I say Samnophis. But we'll see how you say it as we go into the video. So before we go into any great detail, what are Samnophis? So Samophis are a genus of snakes in the family Samophidae, which is actually the, so they're like the main genus. They're, they're the genus that gives the family its name. Um, there are the number of species of them. There are around, let's just say around 33, although it does seem to be going up and down. Some texts say as high as 35. Um, it is, so basically Samophis means sand snake. Um, I'll tell you why that's a little bit of a misnomer in a minute, but obviously that's from the word samos in Greek, which is sand and ophis, snake. So um, a lot of Latin names that start with or end with ophis are something snake. And this samos means sand, so it's sand snake. The name was given to them by Heinrich Boy, um, although it, sometimes it is like falsely attributed to Leopold Fitzinger um, around the 1820s. It actually came out in Leopold Fitzinger's Neue Classification de Reptilien, which I think was around 1826, but don't quote me on that. Um, but it was actually Heinrich Boy that coined the name. It also includes snakes that used to be in the genus Taphrometapon or Dromophis, which were like found to nest within Samophis more recently. Um, and as I said, they're called sand snakes in general, although it's a bit of a misnomer as they don't actually always occur on sand. They uh, they actually can inhabit quite a lot of environments depending on which species we're talking about. Um, and in response to that, different parts of the world, like in South Africa, they're called grass snakes um, and they can be called swamp snakes as well. Um, so they're far from just desert species. Um, in the trade, you see them generally called sand snakes, although they can also be called African beauty snakes or grass snakes. Um, and they're basically a genus of rear fanged again it's, it's difficult to generalize so they are what was considered colubrids except as you know colubridae got split up it was a waste basket taxon so a number of years ago it got split up um and in the case of samophids or the, the family samophida that was a good thing as they're not really that related to many of the species that you'd consider colubrids, so your king snakes and rat snakes, for example, and they're actually more related to lapids, the cobras and crates, um, than they are to what were many colubrids. So they're actually in the family Lamprophidae now, which is you know was split off from colubridae uh, when it got changed, um, and it, it, the larger family is Elapoidea. So they're in the same sort of general family as cobras, um, crates, and a lot of other species that were also colubrids. They are an extremely widespread genus of snakes. Uh, in fact, they are the most widespread African genus. So they're the African genus that occurs over all of Africa. So all of Africa is uh, colonized by Samophis, that, that one genus. They can inhabit not just desert, but swamps, savannah forests um 
I'm going into quite a bit of detail here. <laughs> uh, they, they can actually inhabit hyper-arid desert as well. There's at least one species, which is Somophis aegyptius, the Egyptian sand snake, which lives in hyper-arid dunes that are so dry that even lizards can't inhabit them. And those are quite interested because they can actually go for months without food. You know, they, they basically rely on the trans-Saharan migration of, of birds. And they'll actually sort of sit on a sand dune near whatever tiny piece of vegetation or twig there are waiting for birds to come uh, and jump them. Um, they are also found in the Middle East, uh, Asia, Mongolia, China. There's a species there that I've been trying to find uh, in Western China called Samophis. Um, well, there's two. There's Samophis terp terpanicus, which is newly discovered in 2021. But there's also Samophis linealatum. Um, there was an Egyptian member of the tax, uh, sorry, not Egyptian, there was a European member of the taxon, um, but that was extinct. Um, so now in Europe, the only Samophids are the Montpellier snakes or Malpolon, but there did used to be a Samophis itself. A bit more about their natural history, they tend to be the most, they're not just the most widespread snakes in Africa, they tend to be the most common snakes within any given habitat. Um, I've actually seen quite a few species myself in my travels. So from when I was young, so I'm from Gibraltar, we used to travel to Morocco quite a lot. Uh, and there you get a very widespread species called Samophis shokari, which we'll talk about later, as it's one of the ones I've been keeping for longest. Um, and you get that one from Western Morocco all the way across Tunisia, Algeria, Egypt, Israel, Jordan, um, right the way to Arabia and the Middle East. So it, it's, they're, they're widely uh, spread snakes. They're opportunistic and very adaptable. And that's part of what makes them so um, successful. The other thing is, yeah, obviously they are a venomous species. So they are rear fanged, whatever that means. I mean, we say rear fanged, but the actual fangs are located just a little bit further back from the eye. Um, and they've actually, they're quite cool because they've got the, the grooved, um, opisphoglyphus, you know, so rear fangs, venom delivering fangs, quite far forward. And then they've also got a set of maxillary fangs. So these are not venomous and don't have grooves, but they have very large um, sort of piercing and holding teeth a bit further forward on the jawbone. So if you actually uh, were to open one's mouth, um, you'd actually see four fangs rather than the usual two. Um, one species, Samophis sibilans, which is one of the most common that's kept did used to be on the dangerous wild animals act here in the uk and it actually came off it in 2007 um which is pretty much where i come in i was actually that was the the, uh, the time i first got some of his sibilans um they've got really big venom glands as well so uh, dr brian fry uh, the, the famous toxinologist has a famous photo where he dissected the venom gland of I think it was some of his Mosambicus, but it was definitely one of the Sibilans complex and showed the full extent of the actual venom sacs. And they went right back past the, the back of the jawbone. So they, they, they certainly have well-developed um, venom apparatus, but it seems to be specific mainly to lizards. They're not medically significant to humans. They're basically, uh, and this is a bit of a trend with the snakes in my collection, uh, they're active diurnal sight hunting animals um, and they, they sort of that family Samophidae has a series of quite unique genera so you've got Samophis themselves you've got Montpelier and Moila snakes um, or some people call them false cobras the Moila snakes which are Malpolon you've got the beet snakes which is the other quite commonly kept genus uh, which is Ramphiophis the Malagasy Mimophis the Bark or Mopani snakes Hemiragaris the scarp steckers, uh, Samophilax, which used to be considered dangerously venomous as well in South Africa. And there is another genus, um, Dipsina, which is like dwarf beet snakes. What's interesting about the family is that they have an analog in the New World in North America, um, which is a genus that I've spoken about uh, at, at a conference, which were coach whips and whip snakes or Masticophis. And if you actually put Samophis um, next to some of the smaller Masticophis. They look very, very similar in form, in function and behavior. Um, and oddly, Malpolon, the Montpellier snakes, which are closely related, look very similar to Masticophis flagellum, but just a common coach whip. They are 
extremely similar in behavior and habits. And they definitely fill in the same kind of niche. That's like an overview of what the, the genus itself looks like. Um, they're fairly small. I mean, the smallest species is around 50 centimeters or so. The largest can get over two meters, but that's quite exceptional. Um, but what makes them really interesting is that they are social snakes. So um, when people say that snakes are non-social, they haven't seen or kept Samophis or Montpellier snakes or some of the other members of the family. Um, and part of that sociality is a series of behaviors. We don't, it's, again, if you haven't seen it, it's really difficult to describe, but they're basically called rubbing behaviors. And it's a behavior unique to the Samophid family um, where they exhibit a series of really strange movements with the either the from under the chin or a gland, an aerial valve that they've got right in front of the eye. Um, and what they do is they will press their face to their flanks, their vent, and start rubbing in a series of like zigzagging motions all the way along the body um, to the end of their tail. And then they'll stop, go back to the other side and start doing it all over again. And it's a really, really strange thing to see if you're not used to or, or expecting it. Um, they've been, those behaviors have been documented in all the genera within the family except Dipsina. Um, but I think that's because Dipsina is just so rare. It's... I don't really think they've been kept before, so I'm not really sure whether or not they don't do it or it's just not been recorded. Um, and the purpose of that behavior is that they secrete a liquid that's rich in lipids and pheromones. Um, we'll get on to what that is for in a minute. Um, and they start doing this. So it, it, it's quite a weird behavior because nobody actually understands what the behavior is for. There are two opposing schools of thought uh, with the purpose of it. Now, it's been studied quite a lot in Montpellier snakes, Malpolon, and in Samophis. Um, so, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that now then, I suppose, as it's the most unique part of their behavior. Um, so what they're doing is they're secreting this solution um, and they're coating their flanks and belly with it. One school of thought which is kind of spearheaded by stephanie puri and wolfgang bohm is that this liquid is put upon their scales to stop water evaporation because they tend to live in dry environments and that it's a way of the snakes to avoid desiccating it does seem to be temperature dependent in other words the rate of rubbing behavior does seem to increase with temperature but to be honest, there have been a few critics of this theory, and I'm one of them, in that if it was for water loss, or rather water retention, why are they only doing it on their flanks and bellies, and why not on their dorsum instead? The other school of thought, and the one that I subscribe to a bit more, is that it's actually used for territorial marking and delineation, um, conspecific communication, in other words, communication with other members of the species, and this is more supported by the likes of Cornelius de Haan, who is kind of like the king of Samophis um, behavior. Ton Stiehauder, uh, a Dutch keeper who's also really well up on the genus, Clutchier and so on. And this theory is basically that the pheromones are applied to the body on the flanks and belly, and then they rub off over their environment. So because we know that Samophis and similar genera have territories, so they actually patrol territories they communicate with one another by leaving fragments of this dry dried up um secretion on landmarks and they, they have been seen to actually mark high points and landmarks and if, if you've got them in a terrarium they'll mark the glass as well um what sort of aids this hypothesis is that they don't just do it to themselves some mophis in particular um, have a different system where they will actually mark other specimens. So in other words, they'll do it with other Samophis. So within the, the, the family, you've got two systems of self-anointing or self-rubbing. You've got the M system, and M for Malpolon, which is Malpinius Lake, which tends to be found among the terrestrial genera, so Malpolon and Ramphiophis especially, which is they will rub themselves and then the animals will rub their belly onto the backs of the other individual so you've got like belly to back rubbing um you also see this happening more 
in a terrestrial environment, so in holes and dark places um, where it's suspected that this baby is, is for mutual recognition. And it has been seen that because they pair bond as well, that's the other thing you've got to um, realise about these snakes, is that there is actually a pair bond that develops between a male and a female. Um, and in some species, especially Malcolon, they actually take up, take vassal males, so the, the basically the big kahuna, the, the main male of a particular territory. When he defeats rival males, we don't know the process by which he selects them, but will choose certain defeated males, and it might be because they're related, it could be a degree of relatedness, and he will press gang them into actually defending his female in his territory as well when he's not present. Now, with these often larger or thicker species, that's fine because they're mostly terrestrial. Um, oh, and also the females mark the males too. So they actually, they'll lift up their tail and use their scent glands in the cloaca to actually mark their male. And that's been um, seen to get strange females to back off so it's basically like he's mine bitch back away <laughs> it's a it's a peaceful non-aggressive method of communicating that's the m system the p system and again p for samophis is for mainly samophis because they are more boreal than the, the terrestrial species and that system of self-marking favors a boreality a bit more because the um, samophis do bask mate watch for prey on horizontal twigs mainly the diameter of their body or less um the belly to back rubbing would be a bit harder to do so what they do is they'll actually mark one another directly with glands and, and again it's quite an interesting biology because the glands are not always there at different periods the glands appear and reappear and they're normally between the fourth and the six infralabial scales um, and they actually make little wounds so you you can actually see them and what they do is the males will do a sort of long downward stroke down the back of the female, which I've seen a few times myself in mine. The females do this really weird thing where they'll start zigzagging uh, you can't say, on the, the nape of the neck of the male. So there is, you've got these rubbing behaviors, which is unique to um, Samophidae um, as such. Um, and what further um, supports the idea that these are, this is a social behavior is that with the exception of Malpolon, Montpellier snakes, Samophids tend to not have much sexual dimorphism. In other words, most Samophis, especially, you can't really tell the males from the females. There are some in the, you know, there's some points in literature where certain species, the females may be slightly bigger, but it's a small, it's like 10% bigger or 14%. In other genera, I think it was scarp steckers or samophilax, the male is slightly larger. So it's it's not sort of um, the same for every species, but in general, there's no sexual dimorphism. And this is a way for them to tell one another apart, to delineate the territories and basically to communicate, which is really interesting. And you'll see that in captivity. It's, it's quite an interesting thing. When it comes to other interesting traits, the other thing you've got to watch out for, and this is particularly true if you're handling the species, is that they can shed their tails. So tail autotomy is common in lizards, um, where you've got fracture planes in the tail and uh, constriction of the blood vessels to allow the tail to actually break off and start wriggling. It's not quite as developed as that in these snakes. In some snakes, uh, there's an African genus called Natriciteris, which does this as well. It's a bit more evolved, but in some office, it's not quite as sophisticated as that. So what they'll do is they will, if you grab them by the tail, they will wriggle wildly and sort of spin on their axis and they'll drop the last couple of inches of their tail and it will start wiggling for a minute or two. Um, sadly, that happened to one of my shokari um, around 2011. And I have another Samophis sibilans. I've had a couple that came in from the wild that had um, the tail broken. And unfortunately, unlike lizards, the tail doesn't grow back. It does, the vertebrae sort of remodel into a, like a gray cone shape. Um, and in some places, if you look at Donald Broadley, who is kind of like the one of the kings of African herpetology, uh, I should say the late Donald Broadley, as he died a few years back, up to, so it's between 25 and 50% of the wild population can actually have damaged tails. So they seem to be predated a lot by birds, and this seems to be one way that they get away. Um, so I've got a couple of sibilans that came in with fractured tail tips. Um, 
so that's an overview of the the genus um and among the genus i have i've kept nine species uh, of somophis of which i have still have seven um as i said i got my first somophis sibilans which is the hissing sand snake so sibilans means to hiss um in 2007 when they came off the british dwa list and i had a very good relationship with one of the local pet shops, Waterlife, and the manager at the time, Ali Chapman, very kindly ordered both Samophis uh, Sibilans, Samophis Shokari, and also Boiga Dendrophila, uh, the mangrove snake, which also came off the DWA list at that time, and she kept them in the shop until that October for me. Uh, so that was when I got my first lot. Um, I got more, a lot more, uh, Samophis Shokari, and also Samophis Egyptius, in 2011 um, off an import from Egypt arranged by Dan Fryer, who's a Canadian keeper. Around the same time, um, I got some more species from Tanzania, Samophis philipsii, Philips sandracer, and Samophis subtaneatus, which is the yellow-bellied or striped-bellied sandracer from a very good importer, Tom Halverson. Um, sadly, he's not in the country anymore and he doesn't do import work but he was probably my favorite importer. He always used to cherry pick really nice animals. He had a very ethical means of importing to make sure that he got healthy specimens. Um, I arranged to get some more Sibilans from Millennium Reptiles, a shop here in 2012 with um, a herpetologist named Anthony von plettenberg Lane, who actually, he got his first Samophis off that import too. And since then, I've, I've had a lot of random because they're quite rarely kept they're, they're not really common so i get a lot of random like individual specimens sort of either given or sold to me by people like Chaz from snakes and adders dave clemens alistair mcmillan um just if they get like a single specimen they'll usually contact me and i'll take them um a bit more recently i got the olive grass snake which is a south african southern african species uh some of this mosambicus which is the largest of the genus and that it's really big. It really redefined um, the kind of size. So normally they're quite small. They get to about 1.4 meters and usually smaller. Um, this thing was six feet long. Uh, and I got that from a very nice fellow named Owen Browell in 2017. Um, and then the last two species I've got are Samophis preonatus, which used to be Dromothis, uh, the Olympic striped snake. And uh, that was from my friend Marie Kiriaku in 2019. Sadly, I've just got the one specimen of that one. And then I have three Samophis afroxidentalis, uh, West African um, sand snakes, and one Samophis elegans uh, from my friend Ross Deacon in 2020. So there's a, I've got a, quite a few members of the genus here that, you know, I've been keeping and in some cases breeding for some time now. I'm going to stop for some water as I've been talking so long. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, Ellie, every time Francis talks about any species, it doesn't even matter what it is. After it's finished, I'm like, I want it. You should. They're really, <laughs> really cool snakes. So very interesting to keep. And they're mostly very hardy uh, as well. That's the good thing, especially Sibilans, which is the hissing sand snake. Um, some of the others like Shokari and the sort of the more attenuate thin species, they tend to be more lizard specialists. So... I say they're hardy, but with the provision that you, you need to get them feeding first. If you were to feed them lizards, they'd be extremely easy to keep. If, you, if you're going to try and force them to eat rodents, which I tend to do as so I don't really, I, I try and steer away from lizard feeding. Um, they will feed. Um, and once you've got them feeding, they're very easy snakes to keep. But there's that little proviso that a lot of species do tend to be lizard specialists. The other thing is, is that they're quite easy to breed but raising the babies, that's the difficulty. The babies are born really tiny um, and quite hard to get onto rodents. I keep a lot of the prey species for many of the Samophis. So um, I keep two species of Tarantula geckos, a Moorish gecko, Tarantula mauritanica, and the white spotted gecko, Tarantula annularis. I keep two species of dune gecko, so Stenodactylus, which are really, really great little geckos. They're really cool pets. Uh, Stenodactylus petrii and Stenodactylus stenodactylus which again, they breed readily. Of course, they only they only lay one egg at a time um, or two eggs uh, every four weeks or so, but you can get quite a ready supply of baby geckos just by keeping those. Oh, and also um, Turkish geckos, Hemodactylus tersigus. And those are literally the species that these things eat in Egypt. Um, so what I do is I, I don't actually feed the lizards off to any except the Praeonatus. The Praeonatus is the... Uh, 
the exception as that one only takes lizards and sadly it only takes live lizards. It won't even take dead prey. Uh, but the others, if you wash the pinky, you can then rub the pinky on the cloaca of a live lizard or on the femoral paws. So, you know, lizards, especially male lizards on the inner thigh of the back legs, they've got a series of femoral paws that also um, secrete sort of like lipid rich. Um, and if you rub the, the nose of the pinky on that, and wiggle it in front of the smokers. More often than not, that's enough to get them to take the pinky. Um, and it's quite easy to train them to do that. Um, the problem being is that the babies are so small that even a pinky is huge for them. You'd have, you have to actually quarter the pinkies or use like mouse tails. Uh, it, it's, it's a very work intensive way of raising baby snakes. You know, if I, if I um, had a ready su supply um, of live lizards, tiny lizards, to feed entire clutches that would greatly um, ease things up. But to be honest, just to feed one, because these are high metabolism snakes. That's the other thing. They're active diurnal hunters with high temperature requirements. They're not like rat snakes or king snakes. They are more like lizards in the way you keep them. They, they require overhead heating, high UV uh, to support that kind of active hunting lifestyle. Um, so to go in hand in hand with that, they've got a high metabolism. So they eat a lot. Um, so just one adult Samophis praeonatus that I took on uh, a few years back basically just accounts for most of the baby lizards that I breed. So I, mean, so I, I keep got a lot of lizards. I'm just, I don't talk about them very often. Um, but sadly, most of the offspring tend to go to the, uh, the praeonatus, unfortunately. It, it's, uh, it's sad for me. But on the other hand, it's the, only, it's the reason that I was given the snake is that I can actually breed enough lizards to feed it. Um, some, I mean, there are people that have kept praeonatus and I've got them onto pinkies and my one has taken very rarely, it will take a pink, but normally it will just take lizards. And because they are attracted by moving prey, um, it needs to be alive um, because it's also very shy. So they won't take it if you are sort of there, sort of hand, you know, holding it on a tongs. So some of the smaller species be aware um, if you were to see i mean they're very rarely seen but samophis praeonatus samophis um, angolensis the smaller species they can be quite hard to get onto pinks although there are people that have said that they've got theirs feeding just on pinks it's not the case with mine uh, but i've only got the one so do you want me to keep all all of that in just just to double check there yeah do you want me to keep all of that talk, talk of live yeah. feeding in? Yeah, you're cool with that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a necessity if you're going to keep the species. And, and this is something that I have said m more than once. And a lot of people get quite triggered by it. It's like, if you keep snakes, snakes are carnivores. 99% of the time, you will never have to live feed. But if you are keeping snakes as a lifelong hobby, and you're keeping a lot of snakes, sooner or later, you will come across one that will require live feeding. It's just, it, it's the way of it, especially if you are keeping some of the more unusual species. If you're keeping the easy species, you know, the royal pythons, the king snakes, rat snakes, there are so many tricks and tips with those. And we, we, we're so, we've got breeding them and feeding them down to such an art that it's, if you know what you're doing, you'll never have to live feed. Um, and I never have with king snakes, rat snakes, um, most of the more commonly pet snakes. When you're keeping things like whip snakes, samophis, flying snakes even, you know, the active sight hunting animals, that's a different kettle fish. Sometimes you have to. Uh, it's sadly, if you're not prepared to do that, avoid the genus unless you're absolutely certain that you've seen the animal feed where you're going to buy it. Um, bear in mind that samophis, there isn't a captive bred source for them. I mean, I breed them occasionally. People like Tom Stehauder breed them occasionally, but there is no regular source of, ca of captive bred animals that are of an age where they are feeding. Um, so most likely, if you get them, they're gonna, you're going to start off as a wild caught animal. Now, with Sibilans, and this is why I recommend Sibilans above all others, I don't know if this is because the exporters tend to work with them, but I've, I've literally got them in as wild caught and offered them food on the first night. And, you know, during acclimation, they're literally in a tub with paper and they're smashing food off the forceps. That's not usual for a freshly wild caught snake, but they do. Uh, and it, it's happened with quite a few of them. Um, I'm not saying that every single time it'll be the case, but more often than not, some of his sibilans will start taking food very quickly 
just autons. Um, they're attracted by movement. Shokari, which is the other common somophis that we see in, in the UK at least, that is 50-50. Sometimes they're very easy to get feeding uh, and they will drop feed. Sometimes they're not. But yeah, if you are going to keep somophis, ask to see whether it's taking rodents, as they don't always from the get-go, especially the smaller species. I'm in love with the genus already. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're fantastic snakes. And I'll, I'll give you some photos to append to this video. You can, you can sprinkle them in. But they are fantastic. They're extremely photogenic. They're curious. Like Montpelier snakes, um, they have periscoping behavior so that they'll actually raise the front third of their body off the ground and they'll look around whilst hunting or to, you know, to watch for predators. And they do that in the enclosure. So you can actually sit there and they'll be sort of sitting there watching you back. And I'm not sure which of, is more interested in the other. So let's talk uh, the size of the enclosure for this particular genus. Okay. It's very variable set of genus, but let's just go along that. Assuming that the species that you're getting is going to be the more common species, so Sibilans or Shokari, and we'll talk in detail about the different species in a moment. Um, these are, they're not huge snakes. They get to about, I think the max, oddly enough, it's Shokari that has the largest recorded maximum size at 1.5, 1.49 meters. And Sibilans, which is a much more thick set animal, has got a shorter maximum size, but usually Sibilans is bigger. But they don't normally get more than about a meter to 1.2 meters. I've got one which is about 1.3, 1.4 which which is called Pecora, actually. That was uh, one of the ones gifted to me by Alistair Macmillan. Um, so they're not huge animals, but they are active animals. So you're going to, minimum size, you're going to be looking at at least four feet for a four-foot animal. So the enclosure should be at least as long as a snake. And in fact, with the new guidelines drafted by the FBH, which I'm in agreement with, it's 1.2 times the length of the snake. So... In terms of length, you're looking at, an, although they're small snakes, um, you're looking at an enclosure as long as the animal is, because these are animals, they're extremely fast. This is the other thing that if you're used to dealing with the more commonly kept snakes, royal pythons, king snakes, rat snakes, people, you know, people tell me that their beauty snakes are quick, and I'm like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> these things, um, and I have been told this by others that have kept them, including keep, 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 you know, keepers that keep taipans and brown snakes and mambas size for size although they you know mambas are the fastest snakes apparently a small samophis will outpace a small mamba uh, they're that quick they teleport when they are heated up now this is the other thing these snakes are very thermophilic they require high body temperature they won't even be active under about 25 degrees um, i think shokari its preferred body temperature was like 27 28 degrees but they hunt and exist um, like Montpellier snakes and like coach whips in America at the hottest part of the day, even in the hottest part of the year. So these are animals that are out in the desert, in the Sahara, you know, at the hottest point of the day and they're out hunting. Um, when they are fully warmed up, um, they teleport. Um, the animals that you see often in captivity can move when they want, but they tend not to exhibit that same sort of just trigger happy um, ability to, to, to sort of leap away because most people don't keep them warm enough they're, you know they, they're keeping them like they keep other snakes at 25 or 30 degrees which they'll survive that but that you know they, they certainly have higher temperature preferences so this this is a genus of snakes that it will cover one length of itself like that just um, and until you've seen one move you know they're not like other colubrids that you may have seen now i used to keep them in 48 by 18 by 18 which is for the size of the animal, it's pretty big by, you know, what snake keepers normally use. Um, and, you know, I kept a bread mine fine in that. Later on, um, I, I sort of didn't have a spare enclosure for the uh, Afroccidentalis and the Elegans, which are the more arboreal species. I started putting those in three foot high enclosures, so three by three. And they spend all of their time up in branches. So I would actually say that even a 48 by 18 by 18 is too low um, for some of this. They like to climb. They'll spend a lot of their time sort of stretched out on branches, on twigs, above the ground, if you give them the opportunity. So I'd say at least two feet high. And if you can give them three feet, even for the small species, they'll use three feet. Um, 
for shokari, I mean, if you can give them a three foot by three foot square, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be three feet deep, but at least three feet long and three feet high. That's ideal. That's what I'm using for shokari, afroccidentalis, um, sibilans now. And then for you, for the larger species, the, the mosambicus and Philips are, you're looking at a six foot enclosure um, to be, you know, to give it what it needs. Uh, apologies if there's a lot of noise at the moment. I've got um, snakes just mating. Them. <laughs> so if you could hear a lot of just moving around, that's because I've got rat snakes mating next to me. <laughs> or, or, or trying to anyway, the, the male is chasing the female around. Um, so enclosure size, not huge. You know, a four foot enclosure isn't that big, um, but large compared to the size of snakes. So, you know, the other thing that you will find is that a lot of people will say snakes get stressed by wide spaces. And whilst we know this is down to how the enclosure is set up, this is not the case for Samophids. Samophids often are snakes of wide spaces. In many cases, I mean, they live in desert, some of them. Um, so Sibilans, Shokari, um, Egyptius, which is the really sort of hyper-arid dweller, they're living on a quite open environment. They need wide sort of, they need space to move. They also need twigs and branches to climb, but they need open area to give them scope to actually zoom about. Um, I actually find that they're, they're quite sedate most of the time. And I find the same with coach whips, which everyone, you know, everyone will tell you that coach whips are extremely active animals. Now, the thing with coach whips is that they, they're certainly active and they move great distances, but their foraging time is quite small. They only forage for around four hours a day as opposed to up to seven hours in some rattlesnakes, which are far more sedate animals. They just move a lot further in those four hours. Um, you know, they don't, they, don't, they don't sit down and ambush. Some of are kind of in between because um, unlike Malpolon, which are more like coach whips in that they hunt, some of seem to observe their surroundings. So they'll climb to a high area, a landmark, and they will observe the surroundings around them. And then they will chase down what they see. Um, I believe that Mosambicus are probably more active foragers, but with Sibilans and Shokari, the ones I've seen tend to be, they'll sort of climb up something, watch, and then chase, you know, a lizard or a rodent or a bird if they see it. So in the terrarium, they may actually look quite sedate because they tend to spend most of their time sort of vibing behind, you know, underneath the basking area. Um, but once you, once you sort of start to them or you put food in, my God, you'll see them start moving. <laughs> to the point where you, it's difficult to even get food into the enclosure because you open the door, you know, you slide over the glass and boom, they come out and stop, you know, they've got a massive feeding response. So what kind of UVI are you keeping them at, at their basking spot? But this is obviously the contentious UV. I, I mean, I'll talk about lighting in as a whole because UV is only one facet of lighting, as you know, and heating. Um, these are animals of high UV indices. Um, Many people will say, well, snakes don't need UV. I mean, yeah, that's true. They don't need it to survive in many cases. I certainly recommend it for snake for all snakes. Um, but people have certainly been keeping royal pythons and king snakes and rat snakes for generations without UV in, in dark boxes. So yeah, they don't, they're not going to drop dead without it. I would certainly suggest that it will impact their activity and health. Um, but when it comes to some ophids that, and, and whip snakes as well, these are um, heliothermic snakes. They are sun baskers, sun worshippers, heliophilic as well. They, they come out in the sun. These animals need UV. Um, and we know this because as with coach whips as well, um, certainly with Montpellier snakes, their scales are designed to block UV. Now, that may seem counterintuitive. That these are animals that sort of have scales that are blocking UV wavelengths. Well, the reason that they're blocking a certain percentage of transmission is because they live in such high UV environments that otherwise they would get too much. So we're looking at animals that you could, I mean, I've recorded Samophis and Malpolon at U, ridiculous UV indices above nine, 10. You know, if, you, if you're in Egypt, in southern Spain, I mean, the, the UV index in southern Spain gets really high and Malpolon are out active at midday in, in southern Spain, just as Samophis sibilans are active it midday in the Nile data around Cairo, just as some of the shokari are active at midday in Morocco. You can go out and those are the snakes you'll see if you're trudging around the desert, you know, sweltering in heat, thinking that you're going to faint. And, you know, there's a fucking, sorry, <laughs> there's a, a, a some of his shokari, a little tiny sort of Google-eyed little snake sort of looking at you before doing the sort of <laughs> shung, you know, across the desert. So 
if you're going to keep these ethically, they need UV. Um, there's no argument there. Um, how much UV? You don't need to replicate the exact UV index um, of the desert because these, these animals will expose themselves as long as they need to and then disappear. So it's not that they're going to be exposed to UV 9 or 7 all the time. I aim for about UV 4 at the basking spots, same as I would with most agamids, um, same as I do with coach whips. You know, most snakes, UV 1 is enough, to be honest, like a shade dweller is fine. With Samophis, just use the same kind of setup that you would for a bearded dragon. And this is the the key to keeping this kind of snake. You don't keep them like you would a normal snake, so to speak. You keep them like you would a lizard. So you're providing UV, you're providing full spectrum lighting, white light. Um, now, in the past, I used to use two brands. I used to use the Hagen Life Glow or Hagen Life Glow 2 to provide that lovely full spectrum sunlight approximating white light UVA and so on. And I'd also use a UV bulb to provide the UVB, uh, the Reptiglow 5 and the Reptiglow 10, depending on the size of the enclosure. And the reason I use two is that the, the older style T8 bulbs, uh, the Reptiglow gave out kind of a sickly purple or bluish glow. They weren't very bright. So you needed to put them next to a secondary full spectrum bulb um, to get a more rounded approximation of, you know, sunlight, you know, the Kelvins, you know, you're, you're aiming for 5,500 Kelvin, you know, the same as you might for a growing plant, 6,000 Kelvins would, wouldn't be bad. It has to look white and that's quite aesthetic. It's nice to look at as opposed to the yellowish light you get from like a household bulb. So you're looking at a UV bulb, a full spectrum bulb. And even nowadays, um, Despite the Arcadia T5s being significantly brighter and producing more white light, I still use them in pairs. I use the, the Arcadia T5 um, for UV, and I use the Arcadia Pro for the white light, and I do this for lizards as well. But for some whip whipsnakes, coach whips, that's what I swear by. And you can see the snakes perk up. Um, so for the people that say you can't use, that you don't need UV, well, I've tried some office. I've you know, acclimated 15 some office shokari at one time. And obviously with that many snakes, keeping them individually, I had to keep some in plastic mesh lid fornaria, uh, you know, the fornarium, uh, and some in tubs, you know, in other words, dark, opaque plastic rubs, really useful boxes. And back then, this was around 2011, 2010, that was what convinced me there is a difference because the animals kept with high light intensity in the mesh lid tubs did brilliantly. They fed, they perked up, they did everything the snake's supposed to do. They periscoped and watched. The animals in the tubs just curled up and, well, you know, they, they didn't do much. To the point I had to go out and buy more of these uh, fornaria and put the snakes in them, and they perked up again. So these are animals that they're going to need light. Now, Samophis sibilans is hardier. I, I've acclimated Samophis sibilans in tubs with no light, and they did okay. Shokari definitely need light and i would suggest that the smaller lizard eating specialists are the ones that really the ones that depend on light but i would provide it for all members of the genus no argument simple as that um there is an argument for other snake species in fairness in that yeah most snakes won't die without uv i still think they should have it but it's not like core to their care with some ophis malpolon um, and a number of other diurnal uh, heliophilic snakes, you need UV with them for them to thrive and act the way they they should. They also should have overhead basking lights. These are animals that bask in the sun. Heat mats not going to cut it. Although I do use heat mats in the enclosure as well. So what you've got is you've got uh, I used to use the household bulbs um, and I used those for many years just because, you know, since I was a kid those were the, the bulbs that got me the best results. And it was only when I started talking to the likes of Roman Murin that he explained the reason that it works so well is that that kind of heat is near infrared or IRA, infrared A. Um, and because the bulbs are not very efficient, the kind of heat that they give out was that sort of warming, more penetrative style of heat than the, the sort of the drying CHEs. Um, now, nowadays I use halogens. Um, I mean, you can use deep heat if you want. I prefer halogens because they add even more light and the snakes seem to like respond to the light intensity. Um, so halogen spotlights, um, you can use a couple of them to create a wider basking zone or just one more powerful one if you want. I prefer to use a couple of 20 watt or 35 watt bulbs like 
next to each other so they create a wider zone that the snakes can move into. Um, so that's literally already four pieces of equipment. You've got the heat mat, which can stay on overnight, a, a low, you know, low wattage one, doesn't have to be too warm. The heat bulb and a couple of light bulbs. So these are not cheap snakes to keep if you're going to do it well. Um, and you've got the space of the enclosure as well. So, you know, they're display animals. These are look, don't touch kind of snakes. If you, you know, they, they, they're not necessarily, you know, not amenable to handling. You can pick some of them up if you wanted to pick up a rear fang venomous species and nine times out of 10, they will sit on your hand or on a hook and won't move. And then that one time they'll just go Pew! and like launch themselves out of the enclosure um, you know, and also this is why I prefer side opening enclosures. If you have a top on an opening enclosure, you open that top and meow, out they come. And, you know, you're, they're squiggling, squiggling around on the floor, which is exactly where you don't want them to be when you've got like cables and plug sockets and all that. And, you know, they, they, they just go crazy. Um, if you've got a, you know, laminate wooden flooring, then that sort of does mitigate it a little bit because they find it harder to travel on there. If you've got it on carpet, then forget about it. They'll be like across the room before you even turn your head. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm not saying that they're difficult to handle, um, you know, and if you use gloves, the, uh, if you're going to handle them, I suggest using gardening gloves with a long sleeve shirt, which is what's recommended by uh, Brian Fry for rear fang species. You're not going to get envenomated by the species if you do that, you know, like, there have been some envenomations. In fact, there was quite recently, I think in 2020, um, there was a documented instance of Samophis shokari uh, causing an envenomation that lasted quite a while. Um, I have only been bitten by one. Uh, no, sorry, that's a lie. I got bitten by Mosambicus as well. So um, I was bitten in the wild in Egypt by a Samophis sibilans. And that caused localized swelling that lasted about... 24 hours it was there was no pain it was not medically significant i've also been bitten by thrasops for example which is a dysfolidine snake much more potent uh, snake closer to a boom's length and that really taught me not to underestimate rear fangs snake capabilities samophis they're not really medically significant at most and again don't take this as gospel for that one time that somebody bites when it gets an allergic reaction or something but you, if you do get bitten and chewed by one you'll find puncture marks and maybe a bit of swelling. I have seen people online say that they've had painful joints, um, ecchymosis, you know, um, strange pigmentation of the skin, some uh, of, of the skin, but it's not a genus that is really regarded as dangerous. I took a, a nip by, a, by the big Samophis mosambicus, which you'd expect would be capable of injecting more venom. Nothing happened, you know, mild tingling. I'm not suggesting that you let this species, this genus bite on you, but it is, it's not on DWA for a reason. It's not a dangerous uh, genus. And in Africa, they're regarded as harmless snakes. You know, they're, they're, it, it, people know that they're venomous, but they're not dangerous. So they get called harmless because they're not going to kill anyone. Um, you said earlier about them having fast metabolism. What's your feeding schedule like? In general, it's weekly. Um, with babies, I feed them as much as they will eat. Um, and you, and that's mainly because they don't eat much. Um, <laughs> adults, if you feed them weekly, that's fine. If you, as long as you've got them um, at these high temperatures, so the basking spot underneath the the lamps, they should have a zone which is around forty degrees, you know, thirty five to forty. Again, we're looking at the same kind of basking spot that a bearded dragon might have or one of the agamas. They need a high localized basking area, um, and if you give them that, they metabolize food really fast. Um, and then the rest of the enclosure, ambience can drop down to 25. Um, so obviously, as with any reptile, you will want a gradient. Um, I, I aim for a surface temperature um, beneath the spotlights of 40 degrees, 30, 38 to 40 degrees is fine. To be honest, you could probably even go higher. Um, as long as they can escape that area, I'm sure that 50 degrees would be fine too, as with coach whips. But 40 is fine because the enclosures are a bit smaller. You know, they're four foot in general enclosures as opposed to the bigger eight foot enclosures for coach whips. Um, but they then need a gradient with ambient temperatures on the cool side going down to 25 degrees or below. Now, we know that Sibilans and Shokari, which are the Egyptian species, those don't even become active beneath 25 degrees. Um, so they even beat up coach whips. Coach whips can become active beneath uh, above 23 degrees. Samophis 
uh, 20, they need 25 degrees to even start, to even bother coming out to bask. That's how um, thermophilic they are. They like heat. Um, so you give them a warm end and a cool end, make sure the warm end is, is nice and warm and make sure the cool end they can escape to and not cook. Because obviously, as with any reptile, heat will kill a reptile much, close, much faster than cold. But you know, you can certainly push those sparsing surface temperatures a bit with this genus. And then once you give them that, they metabolize food really rapidly. It also depends on what size prey they're eating as well. So I kind of, with all of my snakes, I vary it up. I like to give them either one large prey, you know, for a Samophis sibilans, a large prey might be an adult mouse or a quail chick, um, or a bunch of small fuzzies, you know, or a bunch of small pinkies. You know, you can vary it and they will take, you know, multiple small prey items and they'll they'll digest those a lot quicker um but you know they, they, about once a week is fine you're not going to overfeed them doing that so in terms of obviously managing these snakes and make sure that they are getting enough when you look at them are you visually looking at them looking at them to see whether they're eating enough whether they're gaining size and weight because obviously this is a species obviously like you said is fast and whatnot and yeah. the rear fang aspect you can't weigh them i'd imagine so I would be more worried about overfeeding, to be honest. Um, if you're feeding a weekly regimen, the snake is not going to... I mean, that, that's still quite a lot, especially because it's warm-blooded prey. You're mostly feeding quail chicks and mice. Now, these snakes will eat birds and they will eat rodents, but most of them mainly eat lizards. So, for example, if we're talking about the African species, skinks and agamas are their main prey. And then after that, rodents and nestling birds... Some of the species, especially the boreal ones or the, the desert ones as well, will also take passerine birds. And there's a series of really nice um, images of Samophis shokari taking lark, I think it was. Um, but you're not going to, if you're feeding them once a week, you're not going to underfeed them. Um, you can tell if a snake, if this kind of snake is underfed because the they should have a perfectly cylindrical cigar-shaped conformation they shouldn't have any sort of dense or ridge um on the back which in other species so i mean if you look at patias tiger rat snakes below these coach whips they are kind of like flattened you know vertically some to an extent and many of these species do have a ridge that if you're not used to it can look like they're undernourished but they're actually supposed to be shaped like that some of this aren't some of this should be round in cross section so you know like cigar shape um and they're very very smooth scaled as well so it, it would be quite easy to see if one is not getting enough it would be a lot harder to see whether or not it's too fat um because the way their scales are so tightly packed you, you don't really see the interstitial skin uh, interstitial skin very easily as you would in obese snakes of other genera so i would worry more about overfeeding and just limit it to a meal a week um the thing is that these are active animals and they quickly associate the keeper with food, especially Sibilans or the Sibilans complex. Um, they will, um, they start coming up to the, the side of the terrarium and they start sort of moving up and down excitedly. As I said, you, if you've got food, they will see it because they, you know, they, they watch things. They've got big eyes and they, they use those eyes to watch um, and they'll be excited. Uh, in actual fact, I mean, I actually think they rely more on vision than on tongue flicks for hunting. They certainly use tongue flicks for identification, you know, like conspecific identification and communication, but you don't actually see them tongue flick as much as other species. They will, they, they, they use their, uh, their vision and you can see that the, um, they've got sort of eyebrow ridges, which are not quite as well developed as in Malphalon or Masticophis coach, uh, coach whips, but they definitely have binocular vision where they will aim down the snout. Um, so they will see you coming with food. You open the glass and they are like, jumping out to get the food off you <laughs> so keeping them in groups can be interesting if they are all switched on and all trying to get the same food you've got to make sure that you've got food to feed them uh, individually um, or just you know you could take them out but you, you could feed them fairly safely together to be honest so like you say how these are and they're wriggly and they're fast are you going in when you service the enclosure you need to clean how are you going about that are you going to to take them out to put them in a container to freely service their enclosure or try and work around a fast snake i mean i spot clean the enclosures daily if i see shed skin poop um the water bowls need to be changed daily um no i don't take them out normally if you open one side and they are 
you know, they'll come and investigate if they've got food and then you can just sort of wave them away and they'll go to the other side. You know, if they realize that you're not feeding, they will sort of scarper. Um, and it's just a case of you open the enclosure, take out what you need and close it. Um, if you're doing a full service, obviously you take the animals out uh, with gloves. Some people insist on hooks. I actually think hooking them is actually more dangerous in terms of if you hook them, Again, they are, they are quite calm. They get quite calm in captivity and they are usually content to sit and perch on a hook. Uh, one tip that was given to me by Dave Clemens is you can wrap like um, a fibrous cloth around the, the hook itself and they will sit on that more easily. Um, the problem being is that if it's on a hook, you're not controlling it. Now, I said earlier that they practice tail autotomy. They can lose mm -hmm. them. You can't hook and tail them. If you grab them by the tail, you run the risk of them dropping the tail. You know they'll start spinning and you can you know it's cosmetically it it's it looks awful to have a snake with like a couple of inches of tail missing so you can't hook and tail this genus that's the first thing to remember that does make um you know sexing them quite interesting or we'll talk about sexing later um so you could have it right on the hook and if you want to do that by all means you can do it and most times it will probably be completely safe except that one time when something sp spooks the animal and it launches itself off and is again halfway across the room before you've even realized what's happened. Um, in fact, I have a photo which I'm going to send to you so you can put it up at about now in the video of a baby Samophis shokari. Uh, this was in 2011, I took it and I had a very loose fitting sleeve on at the time. I opened the enclosure and the thing just went pew, straight. And I was like, where did it go? You know, I was looking on the floor already expecting it to be there. And I was like, where is it? Oh, and it's up my sleeve. Uh, so at the time I was like, here's a venomous snake that's literally sitting, you know, looking cute in my sleeve, you know, with his head poking <laughs> out, just watching things. Um, so I'll try and dig out that photo because that's extremely cute. So, uh, no, if you're handling them, I recommend you just grab them. Um, you can wear gloves if you want. Different species are more or less prone to biting. I find that they tame down quite well. Um, and again, you, if, if they're rear fang, you shouldn't take risks. So I would suggest just using gardening gloves, pick them up. And that way you're restraining them. So even if they start, you know, skitzing out and wriggling, you're holding on to it. Um, but you're also not holding on to the tail. So you're not risking losing the tail and you're not having it on a hook and risking it just shooting off. Um, others may, you know, have different opinions. I'm sure that the large species you could probably use tongs for, but that would be a bit barbaric in my opinion. You wouldn't need to use tongs for these sort of slim, little delicate snakes. Um, so I just recommend picking them up with gloves and be brave. <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about the venom. Obviously, you've been bit a few times and you've not had much reaction. Things like Western hognose snakes are so common in the hobby and they're seen as these like, oh, it's just a bee sting type of species. And you have children come in and just handle things willy-nilly of a hognose. Well, yeah, is... I've seen many, many, many images of like swollen arms and blisters so would you say yeah. their venom is lesser than a hognose or depending on species terrible? now the thing it's, it's a dip, people ask me like with a lot of species like how venomous are they compared to hognoses like hognoses seem to be a benchmark for rear thang snakes so first of all yes hognoses are venomous it's not that you're allergic to them it's not selective allergy they are a venomous taxon we have documented medical case histories all the way up to the 60s there are lots of cause of, of records of envenomation by hognose you can't just underplay it by saying well some people are more um, you know sensitive and some are less sensitive they should be regarded as what they are venomous mildly venomous and not particularly medically significant although there have been now a couple of cases um you know where medical reports have been uh, written you can't compare a genus like samophis with hognose simply because firstly heterodon are north american there are a lot more North American keepers than there are African keepers, you know, hobbyist keepers. Hognoses are very commonly bred and very widespread in the hobby. They're one of the most commonly kept species now. So a lot of people are keeping them. When you have a lot of people keeping something, then the chances of a mishap happening go up exponentially. Some Ophis, on the other hand, are not widely kept. You know, the, there are a few keepers, but it's not nothing like hognoses. Um, and so you have less chances of something going wrong. Um, there was, as I said, there was a documented by a case uh, of a bite by some of his shokari that was published in the medical journal. 
and not much happened to be honest it, it was on should we say on par with most hognose bites like they had a swelling they had ecchymosis they could still feel random aches for a few months afterwards i believe if you look at the documented albeit rare exceptional you could say like the worst results from hognose bites i mean when you say that you see people that have got swollen arms, well, I mean, I, I count among my personal acquaintances just on Facebook at least 12 people that have received a venomous bite from hongos. And almost all of them tell me, well, it's because everyone says they weren't venomous. So I didn't expect it to happen. And of course, that's when shit happens. It's like when people aren't prepared, they're not educated, they're not, they don't have possession of the full facts. That's when accidents happen. And that was the case with me with my thrasops envenomation as well. Um, you know, I was led to believe they were harmless. And so I allowed it to bite and chew on me, not wishing to hurt it by pulling it off. And what happened, I got the worst envenomation of my life, you know, and it was it was quite a severe envenomation, certainly a lot worse than what you'd get from a hog nose or a uh, samophis. But that was down to just simply not knowing. If I'd regarded the animal as a venomous species that could do this damage, of course I wouldn't have handled it the way I did. Of course I wouldn't have let it chew. This is the way you've got to approach any rear fan species you've got to be aware yep it is venomous it is it's not that it's a bee sting well i mean bee stings are venomous but it's not that it's an allergic reaction it is a venomous animal and exceptionally you can have more severe symptoms i mean there was one fellow i think his i think his name was tom hastings but don't quote me where he put up pictures on the old rfuk facebook page um and he had to have a fasciotomy which is when the swelling is so great that it was threatening the radial and the ulnar nerves in his arm. So the doctor made the decision to actually cut open his arm to relieve the swelling. And he's now got a permanent disfiguring scar all the way down his wrist. Now, most people wouldn't expect that from a hognose bite. Um, you won't expect like bullae and fluid fill blisters, uh, infarcted lymph, no lymph nodes, and yet, you know, hyperpigmentation, just like random color changes on your skin. And yet you look at these horrific pictures of like people that have been bitten and they like their fingers are all deformed from swelling and you've got random blisters going up their arm and like well that can happen too it's not necessarily always going to happen but it might happen so why risk it now some office we don't have as much of a medical history simply because you yeah, know venomous but they are the kind of snake that if you see one in the wild you're never ever going to get bitten by one i mean this isn't like a viper that might sit and you might step on it it's not like a cobra that will defend itself. This is a snake that you're more likely to see it fleeing if you see it at all. And it, you know, it will catch on that you're there and flee. From personal experience, they are very, very alert and very, very fast in the wild. Normally, you just see them just like disappearing over the horizon. These are animals that disappear, you know, that they're not dangerous to in the wild to any just layman. The only danger comes from captive handlers, which is if you're picking up and holding it, you know, or playing with it or messing with it. So the only people that are ever going to be bitten are herpetologists. Somebody out in the wild that's caught one for whatever reason, or someone keeping one. I'm not going to overplay their significance. They're not that dangerous. I certainly wouldn't consider them in any way, shape or form harming you. Um, but it depends on how you define that. I think most people would probably be quite put out to get swollen hand, you know, all the, the knuckle joints swollen up. Um, it can be painful. But almost all of the the uh, reported anecdotal bites that we've seen from Sibilans, Mosamagus, they've all said it's quite, it's not very painful. Um, and the swelling tends to go down within 24 hours, which was my experience with the wild Sibilans bite. So be aware of what they're capable of. Be aware that, yes, they are venomous, but I mean, there are certainly far worse, you know, species. I mean, if you look at tarantulas, you know, a lot of tarantulas will do a lot worse to you a lot more easily to you than a Samophis is likely to. That's such an interesting comparison between tarantulas and snakes and venom wise, because you see these really, really venomous species being yeah. kept quite commonly, like bread and butter, as common as you like. And no one thinks about how actually how toxic those actually are. Things like um what are they called? The P metallicas, they have got quite venom on them yet yeah, there is bread and butter as you like so it's funny how we don't concern ourselves with tarantula species and their venom yet when it comes to snakes we're like oh do i want to yeah. get that rear fang snake 
And this is one of the things that kind of annoys me about this movement to invalidate the fact that heterodon hognoses are venomous. Yeah, they're venomous. You can't say it. Um, and yet there is, and I understand why the movement is there, don't get me wrong, because the moment that somebody hears the word venomous, some of the US states, Canada, some of the laws are a little bit draconian and they might get slapped on a list where they, you know, a positive list or they might not be able to be kept anymore. And there's no need for that. They're not dangerous animals. You, you know, there is a difference between being venomous and being dangerous. Um, they're not hot, you know, we use the, 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 the hot. Um, yeah, like they can give you a bee sting, but it's, as you say, any tarantula keeper, no one's going to tell you that the milder tarantulas are not venomous. They're just like, well, they can give you a bite. It's not going to do much. And some of the, you know, the, the more dangerous tarantulas, they're quite, they pack quite a punch, certainly more than a hog nose or a samophis is going to deliver to you. Um, if we're looking at other uh, samophians, so in the same family, Malpolon, Montpellier well, snakes, those are still on the DWA. I wish they weren't because they're actually my favorite snakes and I grew up catching and keeping them in Gibraltar and Spain. Now, again, these are animals that are not dangerous if escaped. The DWA Act is to protect, it's not to protect the keeper, to protect the, the general population. If a Montpellier snake was to escape, it would pose no danger, just as it, they pose no danger to people in France and Spain where they occur. However, you can't say that they are incapable of harming you. There was a, what we call the jackass style of, of experiment where uh, a couple of Spanish researchers, I think they were called Pomier and De Haro, tested what the venom would do to a adult man by shoving their thumb down the mouth of a six foot male, which went about as well as you'd expect and certainly was a lot worse than Samophis or Heterodon envenomation. It put them in hospital for six days, three of which they were blind with, you know, ocular motor disturbances, cranial nerve disturbances. disturbances. They went blind. Um, that is a neuro, neurotoxological effect. The, the, the venom of Malpolon is mildly neurotoxic. You don't want to get bitten by those. Like I know a lot of people in Europe and in America do keep Malpolon. Uh, also, the other Malpolon species, Moilensis, the false cobra, which used to be um, Ragerhis or Scutophis. They were in different genera, but they are now in Malpolon again. A lot of people keep those. I would expect that maybe they're capable of delivering an effective envenomation just because not many people have had it. Doesn't mean they can't. I think there was at least one record of somebody getting quite a, uh, a bite off one. Um, but again, I wouldn't class those species as dangerous. Certainly not deadly, but you wouldn't want to willingly take a bite and you've just got to be aware of what the animal is capable of. Now, when I was a kid, I caught Montpellier snakes, you know, by the bucket load because they're one of the more common snakes in Spain. And idiot, kid being an idiot kid, I used to hand feed them without even tongs. I'd get the rodents and hand feed them. And they were actually very carefully and completely unlike some of his siblings would come up and just gently take the prey out of my fingers. When you look back, it's like, geez, if <laughs> <laughs> like certainly wouldn't recommend a you know twelve year old doing that now, but you know that's that's how I started. But so yeah, I mean they're rear fang, but they're not dangerous. They're not hot, as you say. They're not going to kill you. Like you know, they might put you out of sorts for a day or so. But so in summary, if you want to get into some of this, don't shove your thumb down his gob. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, most of them aren't big enough for you to do that anyway. They're quite tiny little snakes. Um, the Mosambicus might. Mosambicus get in the same sort of ballpark region as um, Malpolon. Um, okay, don't shove your pinky down. Yeah. Throat. <laughs> you don't want to do that. I mean. So let's talk seasonality in some of them. Do, do they brumate at all? Or they're no. such a widespread genus? So They are widespread. Now, I would expect that some of the Middle Eastern to Chinese and Mongolian species probably do brumate. Um that's just the nature of their environment. And there are, if you look at the, you know, the distribution of the genus, Africa is obviously the, the main continent for them. You've got none in Europe, although there was one uh, during the Messinian era. Um, and again, that was due to the Messinian salinity crisis, the uh, allowing African fauna to cross over the Mediterranean, which was dried up at the time, into Spain. That's how the, the, the family got to Europe in, in the form of Malpolon. But the Samophis there was localized, so the fossil record there seems to imply that it was localized and didn't fare well in Europe. If you look at Asia, there are species in um, Arabia, um, 
Israel, Jordan, Oman, uh, all the way across India, there's some quite beautiful species. And then you've got a couple in China. Um, I would expect the ones that inhabit Xinjiang, which has quite hostile winters, um, to brumate. I, I would expect so, but I haven't kept those. Um, the animals that are seen in the hobby, so again, the species I, I outlined earlier, which will go like one by one, we can describe them a bit better if you want. Sibilans is the true Sibilans is from Egypt and Ethiopia, although it has a pan-African range that that taxon got um, split into a bunch of different species. Again, we'll talk about that. But the true Sibilans, yeah, you get them in Egypt. So I call them um, because if you go to Egypt in winter, it gets down to seven degrees. But the thing is, it can get seven degrees at night and in the desert, it gets really cold uh, and they're very tolerant of, of low temperatures. But it will also be sunny. So you could see them out basking during the day too. You know, they probably would come out. I don't know whether that would be the case with Samophis. It certainly is the case with Platyceps. You can see Platyceps in the winter. Samophis with their higher thermal requirements. So what I do with those is I, I keep them in their enclosures. I don't put them in a fridge or anything like that, but I, I start switching off lights and reducing photo period. I think as I described in the, uh, the brumation discussion we had, um, I would call that cooling rather than brumation. And yeah, you can call them for a couple of months um, to absolutely no um, problem. I do the same thing for shokari. Now the central African species, which are more tropical, uh, those don't. Um, it's also worth pointing out that at least shokari and sibilans have, are, uh, we talked about spermatogenesis last time. Um, they, they have type one spermatogenesis, which with spermatogenesis, um, which means um, prenuptial and type one vitellogenesis. That means that they go through their reproductive cycle before or during their breeding season. In other words, they get it all done in a year. They don't use a brumation period to do that. So you don't need to brumate them to breed them uh, if you were going to breed them. Uh, and they're not adapted to, you know, they don't need that, um, that sort of seasonal stimulation to encourage breeding, they'll breed. I find I've had, the thing is with breeding with Samophis, again, we, we have to get onto like uh, breeding. Samophis are odd in that they have very, very tiny hemipenes. They are, they, they have the micropenis of the snake world. Very, very thin, filamentous, no sort of spikes or hooks on them as other species do. Very long and tendril-like, and they only probe to a, a few scales down. I think it's up to five. You do not probe Samophis. You will damage them. Um, I know there are some people that have said they've been able to do it, maybe with one of the larger ones, but you don't need to because all you need to do is wait for them to shed and they will shed, you know, the, the heavy beans. So you can actually see these little snail hole horn type, type heavy beans stuck to their shed. To sex them, just get a group of them, watch them shed and take an average of three sheds because sometimes the heavy beans don't shed. The males will show you that they're male because you'll see the shed heavy beans on them. Um, the females don't do that. Now, because they've got little tiny hemipenes with no hooks, it's very difficult to actually witness them mating and they mate quickly. So I don't actually observe mating very often. They seem to do it when they're hiding or, you know, they, they, they sometimes do it in the branches, the, the Afro Occidentalis I saw last year mating. Um, but you often miss the mating and then you'll just get eggs, you know, a few, a few months later. But I've had eggs as early as April, although I know that Tom Stehowder has recorded them as from March, I think, and I've had them as late as July. Um, I'm, again, Tom Stehowder, who's been keeping them since the 80s, he's like the, the expert on some of this. Um, I think he's quoted, uh, cited having them lay as late as, late as August, but you're know, looking at a period of between April and July for me, in my specimens, that's when I've seen them actually laying the clutches. Um, so yeah, you can cool them, but I don't know whether it's entirely necessary for their reproduction. I just happen to do it with my Egyptian animals because it replicates the environment that they're from. And I've always considered that the best thing to do. You don't probably don't need to, uh, to get successful reproduction in this genus though. Um, maybe with the, the easternmost, you know, the Asian ones like Terpanicus and Lineolatum, 
maybe they would require brumation, but again, those are not really in the hobby as far as I can tell. I think Linear Larsen used to get imported, but maybe from Uzbekistan if they go there. But I've certainly not seen them in you know in my time, and I would jump on them if I had. <laughs> so in terms of this cooling, then what temperatures are you allowing them to get down to? Room temperature. Just um, room temperature. Yeah, they're they're very like Sibilans and Shokari. Bear in mind this is this goes back to um, where they come from, and I've mentioned before. Desert snakes are going to be the hardiest snakes that you keep because they are deserts experience such wild fluctuations of temperature. You get them super hot during the day and they get really cold at night. I mean, if you're out in the desert in North Africa, um, it can get chilly. Like you have to wrap up quite often. It can get chilly. Some places, especially the coastal deserts, you can even see like mist and fog. So there are even variances of humidity. When we talk about the different species, I'll mention how humidity affects them. Um, humidity isn't a huge factor. Um, like you, you wouldn't need to provide much humidity. I provide humid boxes for Sibilans and for the Central African species. Shokari, which is more desert dwelling and especially Egyptius, they don't need it. I mean, Egyptius is from a hyper arid environment like you could spray them maybe to give them droplets or put like water on their prey and that'll be all they would need. Even Sibilans, they do drink, but not you don't see it very often. Um, so these are certainly animals that are adapted to retain water and they can survive in very, very dry environments. That isn't to say that they all do. Sibilans is not a desert animal. Um, and that's why Samophis, sand snake, is a bit of a misnomer. Um, but again, if we discuss the individual species, I will go into like a bit more about their habits. Um, but in terms of temperature, as I said, Egypt, I mean, you can get temperatures of seven to 12 degrees there in the winter. Room temperature is around what, 18 to 20 in the winter? Depends what room. Rooms exactly, rooms it depends on the room different. where you are. But for me, room temperature here goes down to about 18 at night. I consider that fine. So I'll leave them at that without any external heating. Um, sometimes I'll put the light on for a few hours every day and they'll certainly go up and sort of extend themselves under that to, to gain heat. Um, that's actually one thing I was going to say. We were talking about lighting, and I was mentioning the, the bulbs that I used to use. So I used to use these T8 bulbs, um, Life Glow and Reptiglow. <laughs> I used to have, to have to buy so many of those that I used to buy out the entire UK stock online at a go when I was replacing them. But... I have a lot of photos of Samophis shokari in particular. They they like to go right up to the UV. So they seem to like basking directly beneath the UV bulb in particular. And I could say it was the UV and not the, the full spectrum bulb because they always put their head under the UV. And I've got photos of that where they will climb up onto the actual fluorescence themselves and sit there warming themselves that way. Now, that isn't really a very safe thing to do, we know now now with the advent of solar meters and we can actually measure the uv indices and it's like wow even on the t8 that you can get a uv index of like 15 right up close um, to the bulb so i wouldn't do that now i i wouldn't allow them to do that and with the t5s the good thing about them is because they are thinner they they're closer to the ceiling um and with the reflector the snakes can't squeeze into them so you don't have that problem but certainly I used to, like, they used to squeeze up right to the UV bulb, like press themselves onto it or in between the bulb and the ceiling of the enclosure. Didn't seem to affect them, although I wouldn't recommend allowing them to do that anyway, just, you know, because there is too much of a good thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, room temperature here is more than fine for desert species. Um, give them a couple of months of that if you wish. I will... I would probably suggest that it's not even necessary for the gene, for, for those species, but I like to do it. So we were saying you're leaving a light on. Are you leaving the UV bulb on or are you leaving the, uh, the white light? Both. LED? Both. You're leaving just yeah. the lights on, but not just, the heat. Just the lights, but not the heater. Okay. Not are the... you feeding during this time? Or? Very, very minimally. So I would go maybe every a small prey item every two or three weeks. Okay. So you're just kind of like... Every so often, because they, the, of the temperature is lower, they find it harder to digest. Um, and so you, you, you wouldn't feed them as often as you would when, you, when they've got access to high basking spots. Okay. So in terms of like water bowls, do you, look, you only touched upon it, do you see many of them 
drinking? Is this the sort of species that a beginner could, you know, not worry about going on holiday for a week or so? Or? Certainly, you could you could definitely worry about not going. You could definitely not worry about going on holiday for a week or two. In fact, that's I do. I mean, I I usually have someone that can come and change water. Um, some office, if you leave them a water bowl, might use it once during the time. I mean, they they don't seem to drink very often. I would even say that I don't actually remember ever seeing Samophis shokari drink, certainly not Samophis aegyptius. The Afroxidentalis, Sibilans, Philipsi, um, and Mosambicus I've seen drink, and they will, you know, they'll drink every so often, but it's it's rare. It's not like, you know, other snakes, they'll go and they'll start glugging down for minutes at a time. Um, and to be honest, I've also got into the habit of offering water droplets from a squeezy bottle anyway for most of my snakes just because I can regulate the water intake more easily that way um, so I'll do that and very rarely they don't they don't like it um, they don't take the droplets either you could spray them um, now the thing with deserts is that because there's no very little precipitation and there's little standing bodies of water people think that there's no moisture Actually, of course, there is lots of moisture in desert in many deserts in the, in the uh, form of fog. I mean, if you go to Namibia, where like you do get some really nice Samophis, Samophis namibensis, there it's a fog desert. So you actually you can walk out, you know, on the coastal dunes and you're covered in droplets of water. And of course, the, the reptiles and the insects use that. That's their source of moisture. If you're not providing that um, in a dry, barren terrarium, I actually think that might be why you get sort of subclinical dehydration. Um, you, so you, you could spray maybe once a week and see what happens. It's, if the ventilation is what it should be, um, it's not going to cause any issues. So in terms of their behaviours, are they a, like a burrowing species or they just sit on the surface and more climb? So that's a, a good question. So they are active hunters, but what does that mean? Well, what it means is that they will spend a particular portion of the day foraging. The rest of the time, they, you know, and that's usually the heat of the day. So they, be, they become active after most reptiles do. And they are active when most reptiles are not active, i.e. the midday. Um, that's certainly the case for Sibilans and Shokari. I, I think Mosambicus as well. Um, there may be differences in, in, you know, there's around 35 or 33, 35 species. So not every species is likely to be the same, but the species that are commonly kept, these are animals that are active on the hottest periods of the day. Um, and that's when they hunt and they, you know, and that's beneficial to them because other reptiles tend to be estivating or in the shade and, you know, uh, easier to maybe find or dig up. Um, in terms of activity, sorry, what was the question? I kind of digressed myself off topic there a bit. Basically, do they dig much? Because I was going to so, lean into um, what substrate you're using for them. Okay, so Vegas. they will. They do use refugia, um, and when they're not foraging, they will go under things like cardboard or tin. You know, sheets of tin, stones. They. What's interesting about them is that we we know from their thermal ecology that they can they regulate their body temperature and they they prefer um, hiding spots that are anywhere between twenty degrees Celsius to thirty degrees Celsius. So that's still quite warm. They look for places where they can bask thigmotactically, you know, thigmothermy. Um, so that's why I provide heat mats as well. So I provide a small heat mat underneath the, uh, the basking area, usually with a, a stone elevated slightly off it so they can go in. And yeah, sometimes they'll go in there. I find that they don't hide very much. Uh, they're not really a species that hides. They certainly can inhabit crevices. Uh, if you give them like a fake rock wall, they tend to climb up the fake rock wall as high as they can to watch things. And that seems to take precedence over hiding. Um, when they are near, you know, when the females are gravid, I find that they tend to hide a lot more. And that's when you've got to start looking for them to see when, they're, when they've laid. Uh, but no, they're not really hiding. That's why they're such good display animals. If you've got them set up with branches and twigs and overhead heat source, they're going to use that. And they'll spend most of their day just literally perched up. And at night, and again, I'll share you photos of this because I've got photos of it. Um, the Sibilans and Afroxidentalists, I've got very nice photos of them sleeping on a branch together. So sort of one sort of on the other, just three feet high off the ground just at night. So it is a truism that all snakes are quite secretive animals. They don't always like to be watched. And all snakes need to have a completely darkened area, secluded Hide box that they can use. 
I just find that some office don't use it as much as other taxa. Um, they still need it. Uh, I would also provide a humid hide as well for, again, all except the hyper arid species. Um, but they're great display animals because you can generally see them at all hours. Um, they don't tend to hide very much. They should have the ability to do so as they should have the ability to come out from under the light if they want. As snakes are shy. Sometimes they don't want to be under the light all the time. Sometimes they get spooked and they want to hide. But of all the animals that I keep, I think it's those and thrasops that are the species that uh, spend the least amount of time in their hides. So you, know, you can read into that what you will. <laughs> so you could almost have like a, like a stack of cork flats under basking bulbs, almost like a reed stack sort of style. Yeah, uh, and that's generally what I provide, except instead of cork, I prefer slabs of stone, like slate. Um, like paving, paving stones are great. Um, and the reason for that is you can shine the halogen onto it and they warm up really nicely, especially if they're dark slate. Um, and then when the, the light goes off, they retain that heat for an hour or so after dark. This, so I just get piles of this kind of thing um, and just you know stack them up in the vibs and I shine the light on them. Uh, and I'll usually put a heat mat under that. Um, so that they've got the option of crawling under and you know resting on the in the warm crevice if they want as well. I'll just orderly describe what that was for those that are listening on like Spotify and whatnot. Basically, Frats just showed us like a, a flat piece of concrete that is broken in a really interesting shape that he's using to like a paving slab, but like a broken. <laughs> yeah, piece. paving slab. That's exactly what they are. They're, they're paving slabs. They can be a bit pricey, um, but if you can get a bulk stock they, they certainly make the vids weigh quite a lot as well <laughs> but, um, if you get like a stack of four or five of those that's ideal for that kind of thing it's great for lizards too um i swear by them so in terms of substrate for these these snakes are you using like a, a soil sand mixture or are you just going for straight sand or some of them uh, i use both actually so they're like the sibilans is one of the snakes that i just use aspen for as well or, or beach chips i know that it's uh they're, they're not a digging species so in fact, I don't really recall any of them digging. They can certainly go into like crevices, but they don't really dig so much. That said, they do have a behavior where they, you know, they use their head as a hook and they clear substrate. They're very good at, at shifting large amounts of substrate when they want to, but they're not a species that digs burrows, you know, and escape holes the way that some rat snakes will. Um, so you can use, I mean, as long as they can get into the substrate, if they wish, and that's fine. That's that's the requirement for my substrate. They need to be able to, to burrow into it when they want to. But, you know, with some offers, you can use everything from beach chips to aspen. I do use uh, a mix of sand, um, soil and qua for a lot of them. I mean, it, it looks nice. But then again, it's also very heavy, um, labor intensive to clean. I mean, the stuff really packs down and breaks your back. So I am actually kind of moving away from that in a lot, you know, where I can, just because it's so much work to clean, you know, and I've got 44 vids in this house and, and 55 at my mum's still, that's a lot of work to, to, you know, that's a lot of vids. And some of the vids have got more than a hundred liters of substrate in them. They're quite large. So if you want to use beach or aspen, you know, do it, you know, it works just as well. I like the look of sand and with species like shokari, yeah, sands because they live on sand. Um, there used to be a substrate called ProRep Tortoise Life, which was nice. I, I like that as it, you know, it mixes well with soil. Um, but it's your choice, really. Um, it's it's not a particularly uh, important aspect of their care, I would say. Um, the things that appeal to me just keep adding and adding and adding. I'm like, yes, I can use Lignocell. I'm down. <laughs> yeah, Lignocell would be fine. I mean, uh, anything that, I mean, when I say substrate, I personally tend to use soil mixes because they look nice. But if you look at like, for, for example, Terry Riley does fantastic uh, vivs and they look really naturalistic with, you know, the same bedding, Lignocell. Um, I've, you know, got plenty of video of the baby Samophis, you know, that I've bred baby Sibilans and they're sort of, they, those do bury a bit in the Aspen. And again, they, they use it. As long as the animal is able to use the substrate, then that's great. I personally don't like newspaper, for example. I don't like newspaper or reptile carpet because I'm sure it works, and I'm sure people do fine with it, but the animals can't borrow into it. I, I don't like newspapers as well because I think that the ink can be um, irritating to some of them. 
So I've always stayed away from newspaper. If I'm going to use paper for quarantine, for example, which that is something that you really need to, uh, will cover as well, you know, acquisition of quarantine. I use white paper um, and that way you, it's easy to see ectoparasites anyway. And it's easy to pick up feces because it's not quite as absorbent as the newspaper. So that suits my purposes, you know, collecting feces to send off. Um, but, you know, I only do that for a week or so until I've got what I wanted. And then I move them on to chippings or Aspen or sand soil, you know, once they've passed quarantine. So I know you say that you don't necessarily see them mating and that that happens away from from the the eye, I suppose. Um, in terms of the egg laying, do they need like a human microclimate, like a lay box, or are they doing it straight out in the dry areas? They certainly don't, no. Uh, and it, it's a run, bit of a running joke with me now is that I provide humid hives for almost every serpent that I keep, I'm just as a matter of course. And especially for the Central African species, which require a bit more humidity. Yeah, I mean, I don't really see them go into it except to explore. Um, but I, I'm, I like that it's there. I like to give them the opportunity. But when you give them egg deposition boxes, they, they actually don't use them to the point that uh, I think that too much humidity is actually bad for the eggs. Um, so usually what I find is that they'll just like scatter them in a corner or, you know, underneath a log or something and they'll, they'll just deposit the eggs there. They won't use the deposition box. Um, I, I still give it to them in, in the vain hope that they may one day use it and actually gathering the eggs will be easy for once. But no, they don't use that. Um, now, with the eggs themselves, I normally when I'm incubating eggs, especially things like rat snakes, pythons and so on, I use a very old but effective method, which is suspending the eggs above water on tights, just women's tights, uh, in a you know, like in a tub um, with half full of water with aquarium heaters, two of them, so that if one fails, the other keeps going, um, set to the required temperature. And that keeps the humidity at, you know, high enough. And it's just a case of you take the lid off, shake the excess water condensation and put it back on. And that works really well. I have really high um, hatching rates for most snakes. But with some ophis, it's not great. It's too humid for them, I believe. I also haven't had good success with coach whips as well, uh, for the same reasons, I think. So with those, I incubate them on slightly damp vermiculite, sort of, you know, like in a box. And that seems to be a better way of hatching them. You seem to get a higher success rate with that. They are very humidity tolerant. Obviously, they need a certain amount of humidity, but they are far less prone to dehydrating than other reptile eggs, in my experience. Um, so they, they can withstand like drying quite a lot. And how many do they sort of lay in a clutch? Varying species by species, but the average would be about five to eight for me. Um, I mean, at the moment, I have five baby Samophis uh, shokari that I've been growing on for about a year. Uh, and, you know, that was from a clutch of five. I have nine uh, Samophis afroxidentalis. Afroxidentalis. God, that's a, it's such a hard binomial to pronounce. Afroxidentalis. Afroxidentalis. Um, I've got uh, nine of those. So it's 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 between five and ten is average. Um, and let's say that someone missed an egg uh, in the enclosure. Would the adults eat young snakes, or is that yeah. they would? Yes. They. So it's a weird thing where the adults are social. And I've never witnessed, and you know, and I keep all of them that, that I've got more than one. I keep them in groups, uh, unashamedly and without argument. They, they are social snakes. They don't cannibalize one each, one another as adults, in my experience. I've kept them on Pelia snakes, which are even more strongly social, and I've seen, you know, a cannibalization there with a large animal eating a very small animal. But as long as the animals are the same size, you should have no issues, and they they actually live together really well. The babies, on the other hand, can be cannibalistic. And those, after the, you know, they, they need to be separated once they start shedding a few times uh, because those cannibalism does occur. Um, it's never happened with me. But uh, again, if we refer to Tom Stehowder, who's a Dutch herbiculturist, and is, he runs a very, very good website, samophis.nl, and he's, and also the Samophidae Facebook page, and he's compiled the best resource of photos and information on this genus out there basically um so definitely you know quote that in the uh, in the link um he's experienced cannibalism uh several times and what usually happens is that the baby snake will eat the other baby snake and then die the large prey items they can't seem to handle them very well so 
babies can present a problem with some, like I think it happens mainly with sibilants more than anything else. Um, so yes, that, and he's also reported that he's he's missed an egg and the you know the baby has like gone out into the world and got eaten. So babies are eaten by and eat each other, and they they get eaten by the adults as well. So it can happen. Let's go into very species-specific talk here. Let's start with the species that you would say is best suited to the beginner, to the genus. Sibilans. So Samophis sibilans. Sibilans means hissing, uh, and that's it's called the hissing sand snake. Again, they're not really desert snakes, so sand snake is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, but that is, the, in my experience, by far the easiest species to acquire. Uh, it's quite commonly um, imported from Egypt. It is a bit of a taxonomic nightmare, though, so... We'll have to sort of, first of all, go into the, the taxonomy. So they used to be, under the old taxonomy, the single most widely distrib distributed species of snake in Africa. You find them from, Mor uh, not, no, uh, not from Morocco, from Egypt and Northern Africa, but not extreme Western Africa, um, all the way down south to, they, they don't occur in South Africa, but near around there. Um, it was... You know, the taxonomy is beyond the scope of this little podcast. If you want more information, I would suggest looking into the works of the likes of Stephen Spalls, uh, Diogo Parinha, Chris Kelly, the late Donald Broadley, the late Bill Branch. They've covered it, basically. But the gist is that it actually was a, um, a, a group, uh, you know, of a complex of cryptic species that all look pretty much the same um, to the point that if you don't know locality, good luck, you're never going to have a chance of IDing them. And they were split from Sibilans um, to, ooh, I mean, Subtaniatus, which is the striped-bellied sand snake, Orientalis, the eastern sand snake, Samophis rookway, Samophis mosambicus, the olive grass snake, Samophis sudanensis, the Sudanese grass snake, Samophis uh, brevirostris, the short-snouted grass snake, Samophis philipsii. Basically, a bunch of different taxa that all look pretty much identical. Um, and some of them can also hybridize, which doesn't help things. In general, there are two groups. So you've got the Sibilans or Philipsi, depending on the author complex, which uh, they tend to have like slightly shorter, more rounded snouts and eight upper labials. Uh, and that if you look at the belly of some of this, the, um, they will e they either have or don't have ventral lines. So with the Sibilans or Philipsii complex, these have faint, irregular or no ventral lines. On the other hand, you've got the Subtaniatus complex, striped belly to sand snake complex, and these have got a more pointed snout, nine upper labials instead of eight, and clear ventral lines, hence the name Subtaniatus, in other words, like striped underneath. And those are Rukwai, Subtaniatus, Sudanensis and Orientalis, I think, is all of them. Whereas the Sibilans group is Sibilans, obviously, Mosambicus, Philipsi, Occidentalis, Brevirostris, and Lepodinus, Lepodinus, maybe. Um, so, you know, it's a very complex group. Again, making things harder. They can, some of them can hybridize, some don't. In some, there's delineation in habitats. So some will, will like occur in dry messic desert and then some will occur in moister savanna all i will say is if the animals are from egypt as most of the ones imported into the hobby are then they're sibilans they can't be confused with anything else they're quite easy to determine uh, i mean there are four samophis in egypt sibilans shokari punctulatus which is the orange spotted and egyptius orange spotted is unmistakable but only like only ventures into a, a very small area of egypt Shokari and Egyptius look similar. Uh, they used to be the same synonymous. And then Sibilans, you can't really confuse with the others. So if, the, if it's from Egypt, and again, it's important to, to get locality, it's a Sibilans. Um, if it isn't from Egypt, if it's been imported from Togo or you know Tanzania or wherever, um, then you're screwed basically because without precise locality data and, you know, um, the right key to, to check scalation, you're going to have a hell of a time actually identifying it to species level, which doesn't really matter if they all kind of have the same kind of habits. Uh, they all are kept the same way, but it's important to know 
is it Egyptian? Because the Egyptian ones come from a drier habitat and you, you, you know the habitat that they're from. If it's Central African, then it doesn't experience seasonal fluctuations and will probably, although not, not definitely, but will probably require slightly more humidity. If we go with Egypt, they are about, they get to 1.4 meters, but usually about 1.1 is more usual. Um, and they occur in quite humid habitats, surprisingly, compared to shokari, which is the other common Egyptian species. They occur in the Nile Valley and Nile Delta from Cairo to Aswan, um, and they live in farmland, basically. So cultivated fields, canal banks, wetland margins, um, and semi-desert like bordering wetland, but they're not a true desert snake. Uh, and that's important to remember. So they would survive in a dry terrarium just fine, but they're not strictly desert species. Um, and they also, the other thing that is in their favor is they tolerate anthropogenic change really well. So they, they like um, areas disturbed by human activity like farmland and so on. I suspect because they go for the rodents there, um, although they will also eat lizards and frogs and birds and so on. Um, Sibilans was actually the first species I kept, although not the first I saw. I actually saw Shokari first when I was younger in Morocco. But um, as this one before, I got um, my first trio in 2007 from a very nice lady, Ali Chapman, who, who saved them for me as they came off the DWA. Um, and they are literally just very hardy, easy to keep, usually smash food off tongs from the get-go. Um, and the great thing about desert species compared to species that come from humid environments is that the desert has a lot fewer parasites because a lot of parasites use water as a vector. Less water means less scope for parasites to spread. So it, acclimating them becomes a lot easier than something like, you know, a flying snake or a thrasops or a boiga, which will be riddled with, you know, worms and, and cassidia and so on. What I do when I get them is you put them in a tub with plain printer paper, a water bowl and a little hide. I keep them in there for about a week until I've seen them poop. Now, the, the good thing about the printer paper is that if it's white, you can see ectoparasites. So, you know, if it has mites, you can see the mites. It's easy. So, you know, it, it makes quarantine easy. It's easy to collect a fecal sample, which you should then send off um, so we send them to like Pinmore, um, but you know, where whatever country you're on, you should find a, a good place that will test fecals for you. You can get them tested for endoparasites and, and you know whatever nasties you have in there. Once you've got that back, and if you've needed to administer medication or whatever, then they will go into longer quarantine. But obviously, I don't quarantine them in tubs. Um, I quarantine them in basic vivaria. So when I say basic, it has a substrate, so aspen, you know, a simple substrate. It has a few branches, a water bowl, and a few hides with Samophis. Um, and Samophis were actually the species or the genus that actually convinced me of the efficacy of a good light regime in acclimation. If you give them full spectrum light and UV, then that will alleviate the stress of being captured. I don't care who argues. I've seen this. Um, I've, I've tried it with light and I've tried it without light. Samophis need light to thrive. They need light to reduce stress, they will act more naturally when they've got good quality light, end of discussion. You can argue it with other species, but not with some office, um, or with snakes. Um, so my quarantine enclosures have light, they have UV and they have full spectrum light as a you know, part of the core. More and more, I, I do that with all the snakes. That I, if I possibly can, I will try and provide that during quarantine. And the purpose of this quarantine is to basically watch the animal, make sure that it's acting normally make sure that it's eating well um, and that should last for a minimum of three months to be honest more is better I mean some of the animals that I've got in quarantine are two years in quarantine still the animals are going to be wild caught so again the, the good thing about wild caught is that yeah you'll have parasites and you have to assume that they have a certain amount of parasites whether or not that will affect them it depends on the species and you know how parasitized they are but you won't get all of the you know the nasties that are common in captive collections crypto for example which is becoming more of a problem um it's you know more pythons but nido that's a you know those are diseases more found in captive collections so in a way 
because it's wild caught, you treat it as a wild caught, you treat it as if it needs quarantine. I mean, you should quarantine every animal, but you know, people tend to quarantine wild caught more, maybe being unaware that the fact that, yeah, if you've got a thousand animals crammed into boxes, all you know, stacked up, of course, um, pathogens will spread easily. And that's how you get, you know, the transmission of pathogens in connections. But, you know, wild caught animals, you treat them as wild caught, you, you deal with them and then they're fine. Um, and because they're desert species, they're quite easy to, to quarantine and acclimate. Sibilans will eat food really easily. Um, we kind of covered their care, overhead lighting. Um, I used to quarantine them in 48 by 18 by 18 inch enclosures. If you can give them more, give them more. It's up to you. Um, I certainly wouldn't go below that. Um, but if you can give them like a three foot by three foot, they'll love that and they'll spend a lot of time climbing. Um, they like heat, they're, they're thermophilic, so you overhead heating. Um, that's about it. That's all there is to their care, really. They, they will take rodents and quail chicks very easily. None of mine have ever taken eggs, but they in literatures, they will take insects. doesn't happen with me. Uh, but supposedly, uh, at least some of the genus will take insects as well. Um, but that's the species that if you're going to get into some of this, that's the one you want. Um, they're easy to keep, easy to breed. The babies are just as annoying to raise up uh, as others, unfortunately. They, they just hatch out really thin. Um, they're too small to take pinkies. So you have to quarter pinkies or give them mouse tails with a bit of vitamin supplement and um, it's not great because it's not really a complete diet for them. You know, you want to get them eating whole animals rather than, I mean, tail is horrible. Tail is literally just bone and tendon and thick skin. Um, so if you can get them onto like quartered pinkies or pinky heads, they, they like pinky heads because that's, that's quite easy to get them to eat. Uh, otherwise, baby lizards, if you like are crazy enough to have baby lizards, but uh, I wouldn't really uh, recommend it. Um, I'm sure they would grow a lot quicker, though, if you did feed them baby lizards, but it's not really tenable in the hobby, is it? So with these babies, then, let's say you did get some and they did breed. Are you keeping these, all of these babies with UV still or are you keeping yeah. them? So uh, the the babies the are all kept with UV either in, uh, I used to keep them in Formaria. Um, now I have either 30 by 30 by 30 right. centimeter exoterras, and I like exoterras because you can put four of them in a row four feet and you can put a four foot bulb along the top and you can put a couple of those on a holder and then you know one bulb four enclosures what not what's not to like um i could i've also i've have also experimented with um 12 inch by eight inch by eight inch clear seal uh, glass tubs a glass aquaria i've got some up there but i'm not going to lift them down and the, the benefit of those is that you can have three um, in a row so the the short side eight eight and eight adds up to 24 by 12 inches and you can put a 24 by 12 mesh lid on top wouldn't recommend it for some office although it works with baby rat snakes because top opening you open the top and all three of the enclosures are open and the snakes will just shoot out and it's just really annoying um, having to track them so i, I wouldn't recommend that for some of but if you've got fawn area um exoterras if i mean the problem is with exoterras as well is that they've got some little holes at the ventilation points that a really small some of can actually get out of especially uh, on the back especially the older models have like a sort of semicircular bit of plastic where the lid attaches to and a sliding little doohickey that you've got to slide you know where you can fit cables you've got to either blue tack that up or use silicon to bond it to make sure that they can't get out of that uh, because they can't it's happened to me <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I will move those as quickly as I can into two foot vids like wooden two foot vids which I've got stacks of um, with again a couple of little lights and heat source um, so and you probably... really need a whole setup for the whole life cycle of the species really I would recommend it but now you've got to remember that with sight hunters and the other thing about Samophis is that they go for movements they're like the Jurassic Park T-Rex, its vision is based on movement. Um, quite often, some will, but quite often they won't even notice the food that had been dropped in their enclosure. Um, now, there's a problem with that. And the problem is that if you've got a wild caught snake that is alert and shy, um, fortunately, this isn't usually the case with Sibilants, which is why I rate them. 
But if you've got a shy snake that obviously is freshly caught or is wild caught, not used to the keeper, obviously the keeper shoving a dead rodent that it probably wouldn't identify as food, you know, a lab mouse, on tongs in front of his face and wiggling it. That's that's not going to encourage a feeding behavior if it, you know, if it's acclimating. So, you know, that's the, that the problem is that they go for movement. Um, so that's another thing you've got to contend with. These the sight hunting snakes, their, their vision sort of, like their attention is triggered by the movement. So it can take a while to get them to feed and drop feeding doesn't always work, although it has for some specimens. So you've got to play it by ear. Yeah. So with these little exoterras, obviously when you open an exoterra door, you obviously, the door opens when the gap with the hinges widens also. Is that a problem with a fast little snake like that? It can be a problem with any snake if, if you know, obviously you've got to keep an eye on the animal, but, you know, it's not that they're looking for the opportunity to screw with you. It's, you know, um, they, they're fast moving and if you spook them, they can wriggle around, but, you know, you've just got to be careful not to trap them in the door but that would be the same as anything kept in an exoterror, I suppose. It's, it's one of the, I don't want to say a flaw, but it's one of the issues with the system, with, you know, with that type of enclosure. Mm. But, you know, it's not happened to me. It, it potentially could happen. It's just one of the uh, things you've got to sort of watch out for with, you know, with that kind of front open enclosure. I like sliding door enclosures personally. The problem being is that it's quite difficult to find a sliding door, you know, with glass that is that the babies can't actually squeeze in between the paints. Now there is a way that you can deal with that, which is using a, you know, those plastic paper holders, the document holders, they're like triangular and cross section and you use them to shove a ream of paper in. I use those um, on the actual sliding glass door and that blocks the, uh, you know, the gap between the glass that can work. Um, but finding those these days is getting harder and harder, surprisingly enough. How long so, does it take from you to get from baby and exoterra to the two foot? Is it a quick process or is it a long one? Less than a year. Um, they, they grow. The thing is, they should grow quite quick because they're active and they eat a lot. But because in captivity, the problem is that they're not eating as much as they might. It, they can take a bit longer to grow than they would if they were eating like lizards, for example. If you were feeding them a lizard every couple of days, I'm sure they would grow a lot quicker because they've got a whole food item. Um, but then again, rodents are fattier than lizards. So if once you get them onto pinks, that's when the explosion happens. Um, you know, it can be very annoying, take months to get them from that little hatchling stage to the point where they can take whole pinkies. Once you get them onto whole pinkies, they start growing a lot more quickly. And that's when things just become a lot easier. I will say, though, that they are easy to breed and so annoying to uh, raise that I rarely even incubate the eggs of them anymore, just because it's it's frustrating as hell. Um, I think the only other species of snake that I've just found as annoying is Candoya. The Candoya boas, like Solomon Island boas, which also give birth to just a, a metric buttload, should we say, that's a scientific term, of baby um, live-born boas, which are just tiny. And you've usually got to start them off with like mouse tails or m mouse legs and thighs. And it just take, they take forever to grow. Um, some of aren't quite as that bad, but they're squigglier and quicker and just harder to grip. So yeah, assist feeding a, a clutch of those can, can uh, it could be a chore. <laughs> Do you think that's why they're not as popular in captivity? It's just that starting them off is yeah. just so difficult. Very definitely. The, the raising them, I think that's why they're not captive bred as much or why you don't see captive bred offered as often. They're just a nightmare to... Uh, I've even seen, I think it may have been Tom Stehalde, but I'm not sure. Somebody made a report where they used the baby Samophis as food for baby Malpolon, Montpellier snakes, which are like more desirable, I suppose you'd say, because they're European and, you know, under European laws. So they, they breed the baby Malpolon and they feed the baby Samophis to those. I mean, I, I wouldn't do that personally, but waste not, want not, I suppose. Um, but if you've got like a clutch of babies that are just not eating, I suppose... If you're not squeamish about it, that could be one option. I mean, I, I wouldn't recommend that myself, but um, the, the baby Malphalons certainly do like predate on baby Samophis very easily and very quickly. Um, um, one, one thing, Ellie, can you turn your light on, please? In a moment, you're black and white. Yeah. Okay, wait one moment. So 
Sibilans is the most common and hardiest species. The other quite common species from Egypt, um, it kind of varies. Like if you, with the Egyptian imports it, but come in spring, you get loads of shokari, um, Samophis shokari, which if you consider Samophis sibilans, that's a long, thin snake with big eyes. Shokari is a long, even thinner snake with even bigger eyes. They're just really long, ribbon-like and attenuate. They've got long uh, necks with a well-set-off head and just like massive peepers that just, they look very cute. Um, and they've got an even wider range. I mean, they've got an immense range. They occur all the way from Western Morocco across North Africa and the Sahara through Egypt, Sinai, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Oman, um, all the way through Central Asia, as far and as far south as the Sahel. So they've got a very big wild range and they're very opportunistic. They occur in a, a variety of different habitats. One of the things about shokari that interests me is the etymology. Uh, I'm still not sure why they're called shokari. In the hobby, they're called shokari sand snakes or shokari races or whatever. Um, but with sibilans, there's an obvious meaning for that. Sibilans means it is. Shokari is a bit harder to figure out. Now, there is an English word, an old English word, shokar, which means a student of astronomy. Could be that that's where that name comes from because they periscope a lot more. And again, I've got to provide you pictures of these. They, 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 they do this really wonderful S-shaped periscope sort of where they just raise up the front third of the body and just look. So it could be that that was the name given them to refer to like stargazing is a theory maybe. Um, it could be from the surname Shoka. I, there, there are some reptiles with the specific name Shokari, like Dendrolaphus Shokari, which is a species of bronzeback. Um, so somewhere um, there may have been somewhere along the line a herpetologist with the surname Shoka in whose honour was named, you know, this species was named. I don't know, but in Elsevier's Dictionary of Reptiles, you've got um, Shoka's bronzeback, um, Dendrolaphus Shokari. Or, which seems to be the most, the biggest consensus, but I've got a flaw with it. Um, there was a, there were a couple of scholars, Corkhill and Cochrane, I think they were, um, that associated the name Shokari with an Arabic word, Shigari, which means of the trees. Um, and yeah, they do climb. They are semi arboreal and that where they will encounter trees, they definitely climb. But the thing is that they also go in deserts and they're arid land snakes. So, are they really that associated with trees? I don't know. Um, there are trees in their habitat. But anyway, that's a little interesting rumination that I've always wondered about, um, you know, as to where that name comes from, because they're just called Shokari sand snakes, but I don't know why. Um, they're interesting because they're polymorphic. Um, so the ones you get from Egypt um, will almost always be from the Nile Delta and around Cairo, which is where the, uh, the exporters work. Um, and those are like a plain sandy beige color with a really, I mean, I find them really beautiful. They're quite understated, but they've got a really sandy color. And then they've got like a little dot dash pattern down the flanks. Um, again, I've got to give you some photos to put up here of them. But the species can also be striped, in which case they look like a completely different species. They've got like a long dark black stripe all the way down the dorsum. There has been some conjecture as to why that should be, because they, they can occur even in the same clutch, but invariably the, the non-striped species, the non-striped specimens occur in sandy desert, and the striped um, specimens occur in areas with higher rainfall. And it's not so much connected with rainfall, as it's connected with vegetation. I think that is to camouflage them among twigs, because they do rest on twigs and so on. Um, so the plain specimens, obviously, they're sandy coloured, so they're probably cryptic on sand, and the striped specimens are cryptic in bushes and vegetation, even on sand dunes. So they do occur on sand dunes, but in bushes. Now, what's interesting about the different morphs is like, you know, I know that you like to talk about morphs, but um, apart from all these 20 point gene combos and like man made morphs in things like royals, morphs are interesting when they occur in the wild because they can actually uh, incur benefits to or hindrances to a species, you only have to look at the Eurasian adder, you know, Vipera berus, the North European adder, uh, and the melanistic morph you get there, where it can occur in a population from between like 7% to 40% of the population can be black. And it's been found that the black specimens actually inhabit a different mode of life where they, they have the same uh, preferred temperature, TP, 
but they can reach it quicker because they're black, so it, they absorb heat better. And that is a benefit because it means that they bask, they don't need to bask as long and expose themselves as much as the normal animals. It also affects the behavior that normal animals are more likely to just rely on crypsis. They'll stay curled up and rely on camouflage. The black specimens, and I've noticed this myself in the area I survey near my house, are more likely to flee as you get closer. They don't sort of stay still. Black, you know, like the polymorphic um, morphs in things like the European whip snake, Hyrophis carbonarius or Hyrophis viridiflavus, the Western whip snake. Normally, they are a black and yellow snake, or rather like a sort of dark black with lots of dot dash yellow spots. But there's a black version, and the black specimens are known to get larger. Um, the females are, I'm pretty sure the females have got higher thermal tolerance as well. So the gravid females of the black ones bask for longer and get warmer and this may be linked to why they get bigger um, or it could be like the japanese four-line snake elafe quadrivirgata which is a species i would desperately like to get myself in which no difference you know you, you can you can get different colors in that species and there's not really any difference known that doesn't mean that there isn't one that we haven't found it yet but yeah across the um, the range the different morphotypes will be more or less common in a population. So in Egypt, it just so happens that it's the sandy morph, and those are the ones that we see in the hobby. Israel has a striped morph, which is really beautiful. Um, and you also get them in Western Egypt and like Western North Africa. Um, that's the one that you see in Morocco. Um, and these, like the, the shokari, are even more um, thermophilic and heliophilic than Sibilans, they, they, these are the ones that they don't become active until they hit 25 degrees. We know that their preferred body temperature is 27 degrees Celsius or above, which is quite high. Um, so again, you're going to keep them the same way as Sibilans, really. But it's a matter of preference. You know, if you get the sandy ones, maybe you want an open with, um, with scope for them to dash about. But again, they're still going to need some branches to climb on and to hide under. You know, you do get branches on some of these basic sand dunes. Um, they're easy to keep as well, especially the adults. Now, they are more lizard specialists or bird specialists than the Sibilans. Sibilans are more like opportunistic. So if you were to take in 10 adults, maybe five would feed straight away and five would hold out. I've never needed to use lizards to feed them though. Um, I've as I said, I, I happen to keep a bunch of lizards from the same area because I like lizards and I like the herbert fauna of North Africa. So it's easy for me to wash a pink, rub it on the femoral paws and cloaca of the lizard, you know, which is usually very disgruntled by the whole process, and then offer it to the, the samophis. And, you know, usually they'll take it. Um, those ones will drop feed if you, if you lizard scent. Um, but that is something you've got to be aware of, that they may want lizard or lizard scent to, to start eating. So if you're going to get them, just make sure that they're eating at, you know, wherever you get them from. Um, but other than that, they are easy to keep and require the same kind of um, husbandry as some of his sibilans. That is to say, fairly dry. They don't need any humidity. Um, space for them to move around. Lots of light and lots of heat. Simple. Uh, just keep them like a lizard, basically. Um, of the other species I've got, I have Philipsi, which is, and this is where things get complicated because I've got Philipsi and Mosambicus. Some people regard those as synonymous, except that Philipsi gets to three feet and Mosambicus gets to six feet. So they don't necessarily look alike. Mosambicus can look just like Sibilans, but Sibilans can also be plain like Mosambicus. So it, it's, you really need to, uh, to be aware of where you've got them. Um, if you've got a big one, like a six, five or six foot, that's a Mosambicus, uh, and that's called the olive grass snake. Those are the central and southern African ones, and they are amazing. Like when I first got mine, I was shocked because it's basically everything that a you know a three foot some of his siblings is in the body of a six foot snake. And what's more, they look you you'd be forgiven for mistaking one for a black mamba. That's what they look like. They look literally like a brownish black mamba. They are known to predate on black mambas, so they've been found actually having eaten small black mambas. Um, and I'm aware that at least that they, they used to mix them with black mambas in the African Snake Bite Institute or in one of the African snake parks. So they'd have the black mambas, which only take warm blooded prey, and then they'd also have Samophis uh, mosambigus. 
in the same pits and they mix them. Um, and, and they like they really like the heat as well. Those are like Sibilans. They're easy to keep. Um, so if you get Philips size, uh, Mosambicus, hardy snakes, easy to keep um, and require the same care. So I won't dwell on them too much. Uh, there's some really interesting uh, behavioral observations by a gentleman called Cornelius de Han, who is another big name in the world of Samophid snakes. Um, in, you know, he's recorded and documented the breeding behavior of Samophis and Malpolon, the related genus. Uh, I definitely recommend if you're interested in learning about their rubbing behaviors, he's written a very good paper on that. Um, I think it's like the extra buccal secretions um, and infralabrial glands of the Samophids or something like that. But if you look for that paper, that will be, that will provide a lot of information about their habits and their biology. Um, Afroxidentalis is becoming more available now. They, they're the ones that come from Togo, and they look very similar to Sibilans. I believe that I was uh, the first person to breed them in captivity under their new name, because obviously they were reassigned recently. I'm sure that people would have kept them before in Africa and maybe bred them, but since their taxonomic revision, I think I'm the first person to breed them. And I've got nine babies that I'm growing on at the moment. Um, again, exactly the same as Sibilans, except I find they require a little bit more humidity and interestingly, they come from the same habitat as royal pythons. So um, if you're out in Togo and so on, those are snakes that you're likely to see. Um, and that's the case for Samophis across the board. If you are traveling around Africa, you can bet that whichever habitat you're in, you're likely to find a Samophis. And it's likely to be one of the first snakes that you see because they're, they're quite obvious. You know, they sort of they move around during the day. They sort of sprint off and make a lot of noise as they do so. So they're quite easy to find. Um, the other species I've got are a bit more oddball. So I've got a single specimen of Samophis preonatus. Again, that used to be in Dromophis, a different genus. And that is one of the most beautiful snakes I've got. I really rate that species. Um, and that is a wetland snake. I mean, I've been sent images of their habitat. And this is where people get it wrong about Africa and you know places like Ghana and so on. You get them in Ghana. Um, and you're expecting them like the place to be a dry desert or a arid savanna or grassland. And you look at the habitat of some of these species and it's lush, verdant grassland of green glass, green grass. Um, and this is the habitat that they're finding. This species is quite rare in captivity, although a few people do have them and are doing OK with them. I don't really have much to say about them, to be honest, like, except the fact that my one's an annoying bastard that only eats lizards and is like depriving me of every baby lizard that I breed at this moment which is really sad and it, it costs me a lot because I uh, I do like lizards as well but needs must um, and then the other species is another really interesting one called Samophis elegans which from the name it's the elegant uh, sand snake and that one is cool because it actually looks like a vine snake so it's got the long pointy nose that some of the more arboreal species like Ehutula, Oxybelis, Euromesa, um, some of the Philodryas, um, they've, you know, they've got that sort of pointy nose. So I suspect it's for the same kind of niche because they're much more arboreal. Those do need height. So for that, um, again, I've only got a lone specimen and it, it didn't come to me in great condition, but I've nursed it back to health over time. That was one animal that I had to forego the whole quarantine. Obviously I kept it apart from the other animals, but uh, that was going to be a goner if I just stuck it in a rub. So I had to stick it into a more naturalistic enclosure with the overhead heat, lots of foliage and cover. Unfortunately, it, it, it did pull through. Um, and, it, you know, it, it eats rodents. It's, it, once they're feeding, they seem to be quite easy. Going by the accounts of other people that have them, they seem to be fairly easy to keep and will take rodents and quail chicks. But those are much, much more boring, as you can tell from the morphology. So... I would recommend not less than three feet of height for a species like that. Um, but other than that, again, similar care. Their behavior threw me a bit as they don't act quite the same way as other Samophis I've kept. Um, but, you know, you, I would treat that more like a vine snake almost in that they, they look like a bit more humidity. Well, you've spent the last two hours selling me on them, so uh, <laughs> I am pretty much sold. <laughs> yeah, definitely. yeah it's, it's weird how I managed to do that to you, isn't it? <laughs> like, it doesn't matter what you, You're going to be having half about. my collection if, it, if I'm not careful. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that I like that I know that I can't get, I'm like, hang on a minute, Francis has them. So, <laughs> it's great. Better than shops. 
I think that's as much as we've got time for. So thank you very much for coming on, Francis. My pleasure. <laughs>